Okay, hello and welcome to another tutorial video. As you can see, we're gonna be going over the interest tax shield here in valuations, leverage buyouts, and a few other contexts. So we get a lot of questions about this topic and I wanted to create a separate tutorial that gives you a very simple Excel file to illustrate the concepts. You can go to the interest tax shield knowledge base page on our site. If you go to the leverage buyouts and LBO model page, you'll find a link there. I also pin this link below the video in the comments as the first comment. So you can just click it and get to all the files and a written version of this tutorial by following the link. We got a lot of questions about this concept. So I'm gonna give you the three minute version first and then we'll go into more detail and I'll show you how to implement some variations of this within Excel. So the interest tax shield refers to the tax deduction a company gets by issuing debt and then paying interest expense on the debt. And it's roughly equal to the interest expense times the company's tax rate. So if a company pays $100 in interest and it has a corporate tax rate of 25%, then the tax shield is just 100 times 25% or $25. So the company pays a net amount of $75 rather than 100, and therefore the fact that the interest expense is tax deductible saved them about $25 here, and this is what is meant by the interest tax shield. In a lot of cases, interest deductions may be limited or reduced in certain regions, such as the US, based on the company's EBIT, EBITDA or other metrics and the allowable deductions that are based on these metrics. Now in a leverage buyout model, the tax shield should be an organic part of the model and you shouldn't really need to do anything special or separate, at least in simple cases. So if we just pull up the very simple LBO model that we use in a lot of these examples, if you go down to the company's income statement, you can see that we start with EBITDA, we deduct depreciation and amortization, we deduct the interest expense, get to pre-tax income, and then we have taxes and net income, and the interest expense factors into the pre-tax income, that reduces how much the company pays in taxes, and therefore the interest tax shield is calculated like that. Now, in this example, it's a little bit more complicated because we actually limit how much interest they can deduct, and that is something that you will see in models, but the basic concept really is not too complicated. You just make sure that you deduct the interest expense before you calculate the amount of taxes the company pays. Now in evaluation, you reflect the interest tax shield in the weighted average cost of capital or WAC calculation because you multiply the cost of debt by one minus the tax rate to reflect the fact that the interest expense, at least in part, is deductible for tax purposes. So the whole WAC formula is listed here. You take the cost of each of the components of the company's capital structure and multiply by the percentage it represents. And for the cost of debt, you always multiply by one minus the tax rate because of the fact that the interest paid on debt is tax deductible. So I have an example in this very simple Excel file, one of the ones that we use to illustrate the concepts of equity value and enterprise value. Over here on the side, when we calculate the weighted average cost of capital, notice how I am taking the after-tax cost of debt for this very reason. For the cost of equity, I'm just taking the number as is. One tricky part about this in valuation is that the unlevered free cash flow that is the most common metric that you use in a DCF should not reflect the interest tax shield because unlevered free cash flow does not change based on the capital structure. So this is why, for example, in a DCF analysis, we're always very careful to label this and we say that we subtract taxes excluding the effective interest because if we are looking at the company's cash flow on a capital structure neutral basis, we cannot give them the tax benefit of having debt and paying interest on that debt. So we don't factor in at all however much the company has in debt or however much it's paying in interest. And this is a common point of confusion. A lot of people get this wrong, but the bottom line is that the interest and the debt balance should affect the company's WAC, weighted average cost of capital or discount rate in a DCF, but not the actual cash flows, at least not in an unlevered DCF like the one we're looking at here. So that's the short version. Let's go into a bit more detail on some of these points now. So I'll start with the interest tax shield and valuations and show you a few more examples here. Then we'll talk about the interest tax shield and leverage buyouts and LBO models. And then we'll talk about why the tax shield tends not to matter all that much, at least in the context of cash flows and leverage buyout models. So in valuations, the main point here is that you need to estimate the cost of debt, which you typically do by looking at the yield to maturity on the company's bonds. There are other ways to do it. You could take the risk-free rate and add the company's credit default spread, for example, but you have to estimate the cost of debt in some way you multiply by one minus the tax rate. In a levered DCF, the interest tax shield does apply and it reduces the company's taxes when you're calculating its cash flows, but in an unlevered DCF, it does not. So the bottom line is that both types of DCFs and valuations are affected by the company's debt percentage, interest, and tax rate, but the levered DCF is more affected by all of these. 
So I'm going to pull up on screen an example from our levered DCF tutorial right here. And if you look at the unlevered calculation, we are very careful to say taxes excluding the effective interest rate here. And so no PAT and the unlevered free cash flow stay the same regardless of what the company is paying in interest, regardless of how much of this is tax deductible, regardless of its debt balance. But if you go down and look at the levered free cash though, we actually fully reflect the interest tax shield here because we deduct the net interest expense. We use that to get to pre-tax income. And then we base the taxes on that pre-tax income number after the net interest expense has been deducted. And so therefore, the levered free cash flow here reflects not only the interest expense, but also the tax benefits that come from that interest expense. Now, in both cases, the discount rate, either the cost of equity or WAC, will be affected by the tax shield and the interest and the debt levels and all that. But the difference is that only in the levered DCF will the actual cash flow numbers be affected by these factors. Let's talk about the limits on the interest tax shield and LBOs and what you might actually see in real models. So in the US in 2017, the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act was enacted and it put into place limits on how much companies could actually deduct. Now initially, the limit was set to 30% times the company's EBITDA. In 2022, this changed to 30% times the company's EBIT, which is worse because EBIT or operating income is lower than EBITDA since it deducts the depreciation and amortization. So if you want to model taxes accurately in LBO models, you actually have to compare this number, currently 30% times EBIT to the company's total interest expense, and then use the smaller one for the deduction. The impact tends to be low, but it can be more significant at higher interest rates. So I'm going to go into Excel now, an alternate version of the model that I showed you before, and then show you how to actually implement this. So here I am with a pretty naive version of the model that just bases the taxes on the pre-tax income and it assumes the interest expense here is fully deductible and we calculate the taxes on that assumption. We don't have any separate schedule for this and the net income just flows into the cash flows and the debt repayment and everything else that is part of a standard, simple LBO model. Now to start changing this, we need to decide first if we're going to base the limits on this interest de deduction on EBIT or EBITDA. And to do this, we can set up data validation and I can say list, and then I can go down to where we have EBIT and EBITDA, and I can select both of these in our data validation list right here. I will set this to EBIT for now, and then I'll say 30% so we can keep it consistent with current US law on this matter. I'm going to go down here and delete the tax line on the income statement because we're going to recalculate taxes based on the limited interest deduction that we're now assuming. Let's now link in EBIT and EBITDA. So for EBIT, we'll just take our EBITDA and then subtract the depreciation and amortization. And then EBITDA, we can just link to our number on the income statement right there. Now for the maximum deduction allowed, we need to figure out what we're basing this max on first. Is it EBIT or EBITDA? And to do this, I can just enter an X lookup and we can go up to where we have our dropdown selection right here. This is a named cell interest deduction basis. And then we'll go over to our selection area right here. I'll anchor both of these. And then we want the return array to be the EBIT and EBITDA in the particular year that we're in. I'll say NA if it's not found. And I'll say zero for exact match. We'll take this number, whether it's EBIT or EBITDA, and multiply by the 30% right here, which is another named cell. And so we have that. Now we need to compare this to the company's actual interest expense. So we'll get this from the income statement. We're assuming that this company is paying a 10% interest rate on 500 of debt initially. So the year one interest expense will be 50 in this case. Now the allowed deduction will be the minimum of these because if we're capping it and saying that the max deduction allowed is 30% of EBIT, we're going to take the minimum between that number, the 24 and then the 50 that the company actually has an in interest. So we have that. And then for the adjusted taxable income. So here we want to take EBITDA. We want to deduct the whole amount of depreciation and amortization because that's always deductible. And then we will deduct the actual allowed deduction right here, the 24. For the taxes paid, we'll take this adjusted taxable income and then multiply by the 25% tax rate. And we have that. And then one other thing we could do is just look at how this is different compared to the version where we did not impose this limitation on the interest deductions. So we'll take the taxes paid right here, and then we'll go up to the pre-tax income on the income statement, and then multiply by the tax rate of 25% up at the top. And so we can see that in this version, as a direct result of this in year one, we pay about twice as much in taxes because of the fact that we cannot fully deduct 100% of the interest expense in this case. I will now copy all of these across, 
And then I'll link to our taxes on the income statement. I'll use a negative sign for this and link down to our taxes paid right there. And so we have that. You might be wondering what type of impact this has. And to answer that question, I've created some sensitivity tables down here. The bottom line is that if you look at the five-year IRR and you vary the maximum interest deduction from 0% to 100%, the IRR barely changes. It's about 2% different, maybe 1% to 2% different, you could say, going from 21% to 23%. And even if you look at it on an EBITDA basis, it's still not really that different. It goes from 21% to 22.8% again. So on the surface, it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. However, one thing I will point out is that as you go up into higher interest rates, such as 14%, it does start to make more of a difference. Because in this case, it goes from 17% to 20 or 21% for the IRR. When the interest rate is only 6%, it's more like a 1% or less difference, going from about 24 to 25%. So it can definitely affect things, but I would say it's probably one of the less impactful features of LBO models, which is one of the reasons why people often skip this type of schedule, especially in simple models where you only have 30 minutes or 60 minutes to complete the whole thing. So that's a little bit about how they work in LBO models. I also want to address why it is that the tax shield doesn't really matter that much, even though you might think it should matter more. The most important assumptions in LBOs tend to be the purchase price, the exit price or exit multiple, the debt used in the beginning, and then the growth rates, margins. The less important assumptions include ones like the exact interest rate on debt, the tax deductibility as a percent of EBIT or EBITDA, and other things like that, even something like the debt principal repayments or the percent that can be repaid optionally. Those make some difference, but far less so than the more important assumptions like the purchase price and the exit price. The reason the deduction limits on interest don't matter that much is because if you think about it, they really only affect the cash generated and the debt repaid. They don't affect the company's EBITDA growth. They don't affect the exit multiple. And so the impact on the IRR is actually quite limited. And to illustrate what I mean here, if we go back to the file, if we look at this case at the end where we have this 30% of EBIT deduction limit imposed, the net debt is about 324 million in year five. If I go up and say that now we can deduct up to 100% of EBIT in the form of interest expense, the net debt at the end is a bit lower. It's now 300 rather than 324, but the EBITDA, the exit multiple, and the exit enterprise value are all the same, and these all make much more of an impact than the remaining net debt balance at the end. So intuitively, that's why this type of thing just tends not to matter that much. It just affects one component of the returns and it tends to be one of the smaller components versus the EBITDA growth over the holding period and the exit multiple at the end. So that is a little bit about the interest tax shield in valuations and leverage buyouts. Let's do a quick summary. So in valuations, the main point is that you need to multiply the cost of debt by one minus the tax rate in the WAC calculation. Be careful about unlevered versus levered free cash flow. The interest tax shield should only affect levered free cash flow, which means that in a standard DCF, based on unlevered free cash flow, the interest, the debt should have no impact on the cash flow projections, even though they will impact WAC. With LBOs, if a company is using a fairly high amount of debt, you could come up against these rules on how much of the interest can be deducted. And I showed you a simple example of how to implement this in a schedule here. The bottom line is that especially in the earlier years of an LBO model, these could cause differences in the taxes the company pays. And so they could potentially be worth factoring in, but many people skip it because in a lot of LBOs, the company doesn't really come up against this limit, or even if they do, it tends to make a pretty small impact overall. The fundamental reason why it doesn't make a huge impact is because it really just affects the cash generated and debt repaid during the holding period. And in most LBO models, the exit multiple, the exit EBITDA, and even the purchase price and the purchase multiple tend to make much more of an impact than the net debt that remains upon exit. That's it for this lesson. Hopefully now you know a little bit more about the interest tax shield and why, although it's good to know about this concept, it's not really a huge driver in most deals and is usually not something that's going to make or break a deal.